Hello and welcome to the Quarantine Quadly podcast with your hosts Stan and Adam and a very special guest, Tom Barkley uh, from NASA. Hello, Tom. Hey, thanks for having me on. No, no problem. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. So, Tom, who are you and what do you do? So, I'm a research scientist. I work at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, uh, just outside D.C., and I study planets orbiting other stars uh, using space telescopes. So I help operate those telescopes. I um, look at the data they bring down. I analyze the data and study it and try and find planets and then try and learn things about those planets. Can I just say, I think that's the best introduction um, we've had so far. Lots of people, when we say, who are you, kind of break down. They have to think about it for a second. <laughs> No problem. <laughs> it's the most existential question they've ever faced. They just completely melt. Yeah, no problem. I practiced it. I mean, a few <laughs> times you get asked similar kind of things like, hey, just who are you? What's what's your job or whatever? So I have a, not a canned response, but at least a, it's something that isn't completely new to me. Scripted. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so... so- first- Oh, sorry, you first. Oh, I was going to say, Stan, do you want to introduce the topic? <laughs> okay. So the first, and tying in nicely to um, what we do on this podcast, talking about how quarantine has affected work life, I suppose the main question we want to ask here today is, how has COVID-19 affected operations at NASA? Yeah, I mean, of course, it's it's affecting the whole planet. So it's, it's affecting us at NASA. Um, we're in a pretty fortunate position in general. Um, a lot of, like myself, a lot of the work I do is, um, you know, I, I analyze data. Um, I can do a lot of that from home. Um, a lot of what we do is analysis of data and people are able to kind of transition to working at home. But no doubt it causes, uh, it's, it's difficult and causes disruptions. Um, where I work, we were one of the first places to sort of have, um, I think, I, I forget the exact language, but it was along the lines of strongly encouraged telework. Um, and then very quickly went to mandatory telework. So um, we were off out of off work and working from home for quite a long time before, like t- t- two weeks before most people were. Um, and, and you know, perhaps part of that is that there are so many scientists and, and, and people who understand exponential distributions uh, high up at the agency that the, that the way things were going was, was fairly clear. Um, some things have, have absolutely shut down. Um, you know, the lab, people work in labs. Um, they aren't able to do most of that work. Um, uh, but but a lot of it is just carrying on. Um, we still are able to operate the spacecraft I work on. Uh, so so the people who are using the um, so spacecraft communicate to the ground using things we call ground stations. They're typically big radio dishes. Um, there are several different ones of these, different networks of these. But um, NASA's uh, ground stations are still operating so so we're able to bring the data down uh the people who operate our spacecraft uh the one i work on um uh also operate uh other spacecraft for other government agencies and those agencies aren't going to be going down anytime soon and so they're they're still operating fine and even those who are operating um uh don't work on uh, national security projects uh the spacecraft are still operating usually at kind of a skeleton crew um level so so that that kind of stuff's still going the status data still coming down um we're still able to run the kind of data processing pipelines uh remotely with with you know maybe one or two people uh able to come in and you know reset servers and things like that um but generally generally it's pretty smooth people are people are doing well um for, in the situation but you know it's hard it's hard not seeing anyone uh, Zoom and and um, what what have you make 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 a big difference. I don't. I think it would be a lot more challenging if this has happened even sort of five years ago. Um, but we all sit and talk to each other every uh, every every day for several hours a day on various meetings that, that really haven't changed all that much. Um, and we're to some extent a distributed organization already. I you know I work in in um, Maryland. I talk every day to my colleagues who work at MIT in Boston and other colleagues who work in California. And so 
the fact that I'm doing it from my house as opposed to sitting in a conference room um, really hasn't changed all that much. Um, can I ask, actually, um, do you use Zoom uh, for these work calls as well? Is that because when Zoom first became popular, when they, there was tons of security concerns, and I imagine like an, uh, uh, an organization like NASA would would be concerned about that. Do, do you guys Zoom, or is it just kind of taken out? You, you, you don't use Zoom? Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a whole array of different teleconferencing software that we're using and and it and it really depends on who's initiating the call so um my calls with mit mit has a i think a site license for zoom and a site license for another software called webex so mm. we use whichever one they initiate um this, if, if there's anything kind of sensitive then there are different rules apply but most of what we do there isn't there's no kind of sensitive nature um mm. we internally at nasa use either something called webex or uh our learning to love Microsoft Teams, which is our new. Oh, yes. That's the, that's the uh, blessed and official way we're being told to operate things. So <laughs> I'm getting, getting a lot of experience on how, how that works. Um, so I, I, I think a lot of it's feeling out. Um, during the early days, you know, there was a lot more, let's just do whatever works. And as we've kind of moved in, there's more of the sort of, hey, you know, you should really follow the, the prescribed way of, a way of doing things. Mm. Um, I have I, I, one of the things that I have really appreciated is is how much the kind of all the way through management they've, they've, they've understood that this is a pretty crazy time and, and are willing to sort of help be flexible and help make things work. You know, you hear a lot about inflexible government bureaucrats and they're like, and that happens a lot. You know, we're a government agency and we have a lot of bureaucracy, um, a lot of it necessary because, you know, we have billion dollar projects. You want some level of oversight. Um, but but I really have appreciated how how willing and how hard everybody is working to kind of keep, keep the show on the road. Yeah, we we're using uh, Teams as well. We we make to use Teams. I um, we often have to speak to quite a few doctors, physicians, because we have to interview them, and they uh, will want to use Zoom even though they don't really like it. So it's kind of like this situation where some of these companies that kind of pay these doctors don't want to use Zoom because of the security concerns, but then and um, they just want to do it. So I, th I thought NASA being so, I mean, like you say, there's so much that goes through NASA, like uh, details uh, that probably shouldn't get out. So I wondered how it was. It's interesting to know. Yeah, you know, that there are, we're, we're pr pretty well versed in, you know, the, the different levels of, Mm. Of, of of what what can be done on different different networks you know we, in the us we constantly deal with something called itar which is the international transfer of arms regulations but it basically means that um, um anything that could be used in munitions which a lot of satellite you know if you're launching a rocket a lot of that technology is similar to uh an aggressive method and a lot of imaging technology or detect the specific of detectors we use um is, is stuff that the US um, wouldn't want other countries to, you know, to be exported as mm. kind of national security uses of these. And so there's a lot of care taken when we're dealing with anything like that. But, you know, nearly all the time, we're not dealing with, you know, the, the details of how uh, a, a circuit board is laid out <laughs> or, or the precise resolution uh, of state-of-the-art detectors. More often, we're dealing with schedules. And, right. Um, <laughs> And and to be honest, checking on the uh, physical and mental health of our colleagues right now. Yeah, that's important. That's very important. Yeah. It's very interesting how you said that if this had been perhaps even just five years ago, this would have been a problem. And it's all due to technology that, or sort of a software that anyone can get their hands on has been so helpful to such a major organization. Yeah, it. I mean... Yeah, it, it 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 really has made I think this this being stuck inside most of the time and not interacting with people pretty tolerable. I mean, I certainly am able to keep sane with with sort of um, uh, happy hours with friends via via you know video conferencing and playing things like Jackbox games um, via Zoom and whatnot and and. Um, I think that, I mean, you know, we have, we have like film night and then we discuss films and 
drink drinks on on camera um that kind of thing you know maybe it existed five years ago but not not in the same way not the same prevalence mm -hmm. um it, it, i think it's 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 really loud us to get through this i think one of the things for me i'm so it's most impressed and surprised about is how you know th there's lots of concerns that some people aren't keeping up the uh the isolation as well as perhaps you know we would like to see but i think the fact that up until now people have done remarkably well at keeping you know changing everything about their life and just sort of going to being isolated nearly everyone's just doing it and part of that is that we have the entertainment to hand we can talk to people um uh, very easily and keep in touch so i think it's it has allowed it allowed it to work I was I was discussing that with friends actually. Like I couldn't even imagine like quarantining in the nineteen time or even in the early you know two thousands what quarantining would be like. Yeah, it's certainly it's certainly different different now. We have so much, you know, I watch a lot of video streaming, play video games. Oh, a whole bunch of us astronomers have started playing Fortnite <laughs> absolutely terribly. Um but, uh, you know, it's, it's one way to, you can chat with your friends, you know, I mean, I guess this is what teenagers have been doing for the last, <laughs> back when Fortnite was still kind of cool. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's been, that's been pretty fun, um, uh, way to kind of keep, keep, keep sane and keep going. But now we know that the, uh, the game for NASA scientists is Fortnite. How do you feel about Absolutely. That? Yeah, yeah, we, all of us getting destroyed by 12 year olds. <laughs> should we um should we talk about the uh the, the big projects then tests absolutely so um because we spoke about this what two years ago was it something like that when it launched and it was very very interesting i thought the mission was very very cool could you give us like a short rundown of what the mission of tess is Absolutely. Yeah. So Tess launched uh, just over two years ago now. Um, probably the most exciting day of my career was going down to um, uh, the Cape um, at Kennedy Space Station, uh, Kennedy Space Center, where it was launching from. Um, we got there I don't know, a couple of days before, got prepared, rehearsed what we do for the media, um, and then the day of launch, we did a whole bunch of media interviews. We uh, hobnobbed around with people who uh, uh, in suits um, talking about them. Uh, got about, I think, three hours before launch. And then we got, um, as happens a lot, a 48-hour delay to launch. So then we went back to the beach in Florida, back to Cocoa Beach for a couple of days, and then did the whole thing again. And finally watched, watched the launch. Um, so the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite Tess is uh, searching for planets around other stars. Um, it's kind of part of n what NASA's mission is, is to search for life beyond Earth. Um, and there are kind of two primary ways that NASA is doing this. One is by searching for evidence of life in our solar system. So uh, a lot of the Mars missions are doing this. Um, in the future, there'll be missions to like Europa um, and, and, and other moons of Jupiter and Saturn to search for, to, for evidence of, of life ever existing um, in those places. Um, the other part is searching for life beyond the solar system around other stars. And so that's what I'm focused on. So TESS is part of that journey. Um, it started um, with the discovery of the first parts around other stars in the, in the, the mid 90s. Um, we now know that small planets exist, planets that are Earth-sized. We know that a few planets that are Earth-sized and orbit kind of in the temperate region around their stars. But what we really want to do is, is learn more about those planets. Um, and so NASA is building big space telescopes, kind of successes to Hubble to go and do that. But um, to study those, we need a really great target list. We need to like, find the best planets so then we can study them in detail. And Tess's role is to find those really good planets. Um, we call it like test of the finder scope. It finds these great planets, and then we can study their atmospheres with kind of the next generation missions. Um, mm -hmm. You may have heard of a mission called the James Webb Space Telescope. 
it's kind of the the NASA's next flagship and due to launch uh, in, b b before this uh, the pandemic it was due to launch in March um, of next year. Um, we'll see what happens with that because a lot of the testing has got delayed. But um, but certainly the plan is to have that launched in 2021. Um, and, and that's going to be able to look into the atmospheres of planets that we find. So Tess is finding these fantastic planets. Webb's going to then be able to stare at these planets and study their atmospheres. Are there any planets in mind for what um, that you found that would look like a good candidate for, to be looked at? Y yeah, Tess has found some, some really good planets. So we're looking for planets that are um, relatively close to us. So essentially, the closer the planet is, the easier it is to study. Um, and so by close, you know, within um, 10 light years, I think, is, is, is that, that kind of distance. Um, and it's just not all that close, but it's, it's in the whole cosmic scale. It's actually very close. Um, and orbiting, for, for, for Webb particularly, probably orbiting smaller stars. The way, the way, our, kind of way we study these, um, the smaller the star, the bigger our signal. Um, because what we're measuring is kind of the ratio of the size of the planet to the size of the star. That's kind of our signal. So you shrink the size of the star, that ratio increases. So you have a bigger signal. Um, and we have some really nice candidates so far. Um, one or two of them are kind of orbiting in what we call this habitable zone, this kind of Goldilocks zone that isn't too hot and isn't too cold. Um, and so those are going to be some excellent places to study. Um, and then uh, we're hoping to find a few more of those uh, so that we can really have uh, a nice a nice selection of planets to, to, to understand. Have there been any um, discoveries that really excited you? I mean, in my career, yeah, I, absolutely. Um, I have to think what, what the most exciting thing we've found is. I mean, up there for me, is something we call a circumbinary planet. So um, you, you, our sun is, is a star. Um, unlike probably about two thirds of stars in our galaxy, uh, the sun is a single star, but most stars are probably what we call binary stars. There's two stars and they orbit each other. Um, uh, so what you is possible, and, and, and it was kind of pr interestingly predicted from science fiction, um, is that it's possible to have a planet that goes around the outside of those two stars. Those two stars orbit each other, and then add beyond those as a planet going around them. Um, there are some pretty famous examples in science fiction of this. Uh, the most famous um, being Tatooine. There's the famous double sun sunset, um, while the kind of uh, music, John Williams music plays. But you know, other, other famous ones are Gallifrey is a, meant to be a circumbinary planet orbiting two stars um, and uh, a famous book called Solaris, I think is, is at least as far as I know, the first, first time we knew of in literature, there was kind of this idea of a planet orbiting two stars. When but, was Solaris so, written? So, sorry. Sorry, Karen. When was Solaris written? Oh, early 1900s. Oh, wow. So that, yeah. that long ago, this, uh, this idea was being... Well, at least theorized, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, 19... Uh, it was, it's obviously been a film multiple times, but I don't know when the book was. Um, but it was by someone called Stanislav Lem. Uh, okay, it was 1960s, I guess. I thought it was earlier oh, no. than that. Um, still, so uh, that, this idea had been from the 60s, the, the idea that you have have these things. And so in, in 2012, we discovered the first one of these planets, um, I think was incredibly exciting because um, not only did we, you know, we got to announce something that's, that's I think some, a really cool thing that, that kind of science fiction is exciting for me. Um, we did a press release and we um, worked with Industrial Light and Magic on that press, press release, who is uh, kind of the, the George Lucas's special effects company, um, which was pretty cool. Oh wow! Um, and did what well, did they animate the planets? Going uh, yeah, yeah, they, they and they let us. Yeah, they, they, there was someone uh, from Industrial Light and Magic on our press panel. Um, they let us use the Star Wars footage in our press releases. 
um, yeah, it, it was it was it was a lot of fun about how they they came up with this idea and, and what we're doing. Um, yeah, and and since then, I think we know of of uh, a dozen of these types of planets. Um, so they're they're not all that rare. Um, No, just just out of, ask just out of curiosity, what um, oh, what, what 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 is it like a planet orbiting two suns? Because I imagine it must be like a pretty crazy orbital cycle. Yeah, so so I mean, for the orbit to be stable, you need to be um, the the orbit your orbit like how long the planet's year is needs to be significantly longer than it takes for the stars to go around each other. Um, and so, effectively, the, 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 the way it works is the gravity, effectively, the gravity that the, the planet feels need to, needs to be pretty close to a constant amount of gravity. Um, but what it doesn't have a constant amount of is illumination. And so the star, depending on the positions of the stars, the planet's going to be seeing one or two stars at a given time. Um, and those stars need not be the same temperature and therefore not the same color. So you can imagine, you know, one... Kind of yellow star and one red star going around each other and then the the kind of color of the light that, that that you're seeing is changing changing all the time and it's also going to be hotter and colder you know depending on all your orbits what your orbits like and what the orbit of the, the stars is like um so it would be quite a different environment from from the one we we live in because i was gonna i was gonna say i've never thought about this till now but i guess like Imagine how crazy the day, the day, or even like just the cycles in Tatooine would be in general. Yeah, it would be very different. I mean, you see some pretty incredible sunsets. Oh yeah. Uh, you possibly Grayson's... know what one sunset would be exactly the same as as as, as another. Yeah. So yeah, you'd have the variety at least. Mm -hmm. How would how do you, how would how would days work though? Because depending on where you are in the sun, wouldn't the daytimes be completely different? So your day is controlled by how long it takes to orbit on the axis, how long it takes, say, Earth, Earth to spin once around. Mm. And so the, the, the two stars would be relatively close together in the sky. Um. And so you, you'd probably, if you're on Earth, like, planet you know spinning one day you you'd still you know have have that same kind of uh day night cycle although during the because basically you're facing away from those stars for you know half of the day and then towards them it would slightly change the length of the day um depending on the orientation of, of the stars relative to you um but it, it wouldn't be as huge a difference. It's just during that day, your your the amount of sunlight you get is going to be constantly changing. Mm. Oh wow, that's a weird thing to think about. <laughs> yeah, one one of the things I like to think about, you know, is is what are the things that make make us like human? Uh, like how how much of it is due to where we live, and how much it is because that's how kind of li what life needs. So as an example, you know, we live around a, you know, a yellow star um, of a particular size, a particular temperature. Um, how much of that, like, is, is just happenstance that we formed around that and then we evolved to be, you know, perfectly adapted to living around that kind of star? And how much is that's the best place for life to kind of show up? Um, if, if, if we lived around a binary star system, in, in one of these certain binary stars, and we went searching for life, would we only think life can form around binary star systems because that's where we formed? Or, you know, how much are you conditioned by where you live? Yeah. Well, it would have to be, wouldn't it? Because then they wouldn't know that there's this principle of one star, wouldn't it? So it's like um, a, a civilization like us, but would think the two the binary star is the new normal is that, is that am i getting this right yeah yeah you know my thought is is you know we think you know the sun like star is is the best place to live around but that's because mm. we live here you know i can imagine that your ideas of how planets yeah. form and evolve is going to be colored by 
by where where you live particularly mm. you know one of these ideas is is people think stars particularly much cooler than the sun might not be great places for life uh because those types of stars particularly when they're younger tend to be very active have a lot of flares um but it might be the case that 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 amount of energy that these stars are putting out isn't enough to to to, to you know to, to kill life on the planet but it's just enough to, to kind of uh, give enough energy to the system um, uh, to give to give plenty of ultraviolet radiation, not too much, not not too little, that it that maybe it 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 is it's good for life. Um, and you know, one of the things that kind of strength we know life kind of excels because of extinction events. Those that manage to survive become more robust. You know, maybe if you're in a, you know, is life are we the the the, the optimal life or is there even more better places to more habitable planets than, than we live on. Mm. I think those are kind of interesting questions. Not that we can particularly answer them until we, we find some more life though. Yeah. And I, I was going to say, even, even then, what if, depending on how life evolved, is it possible that there's like conditions we would never consider habitable that are just perfectly fine for life like that? Yeah. Well, one of the places, you know, that, that might well be good, a good place for life is, um, in, in, in oceans, in, in the bottom of ocean, you know, um, in ocean worlds, you know, we have these um, m- methane lakes on, on um, moons of, of, of Jupiter and Saturn. Um, we don't, you know, typically think of them being, of being great places for life, but maybe they, maybe they are. Um, it would be challenging for us to kind of find that life, but, but, and it would be quite different to what we have here, but that's, uh, I think, an int- interesting places to look to, and to search. Well, um, if sci-fi movies have taught me anything, um, they, we are the most optimal life form. We always seem to win. Yeah, do pretty well. Um, <laughs> well, we shouldn't really, but... <laughs> you know, there are sci-fi movies where we don't do as well. <laughs> no, I was... I was just thinking, there's one where we, what, oh no, I've forgotten it. I was going to try and like make out like I knew what sci-fi movies were. There's, <laughs> I know there's a, I know there's a televised series where, don't they go back in time at the end? Because they have to escape. Yes. You know what I'm oh, talking the about. Really bad, is it the really bad one? They go back in time and there's uh, dinosaurs. Is that it? No, I'm prob- I'm thinking of something oh. completely different. Oh, I tried to I tried to breach into a subject I didn't know enough about. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Oh, oh, do you know what? Battlestar Rita. That that's a sci-fi series where a giant alien planet comes and eat us, eats us. So we don't do too well in that one. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I just started watching a show called The Expanse. Have you watched that? Yes. Yeah, that's it's pretty a- pretty great. It's the is it? I thought the first season though did. I I can't remember it because it's been a while since I last saw it. But I remember being frustrated by the first few episodes. Because I, I don't know. Is it? Am I remembering this wrong? Yeah, the first few episodes are really hard to follow. There's like mm. so many plot threads. Yeah, I, I've only. I mean, I'm not that far in. I'm. I'm. Haven't finished the second season yet. But um, so far, it's pretty pretty great. Yes. Have you seen um, the 100? I know this is not about. Well, I guess it's it is now about planets. But have you heard of it? I mean, I I, I see it and I never clicked play uh, when it's come up. You know, it's probably good. It's it's not bad, right? The series is not bad in itself, but it's so frustrating. I only I only brought it up because it's the one I've, uh, I finished recently, and it's just constantly. I told Stan this the other day. It's just constant nonsense, like. The main character always survives. I think she survived a nu- two nuclear me- meltdowns just by hiding slightly under some kind of <laughs> metal. <laughs> she hid from the radiation. Uh, yes. Have you I watched? Um, have you seen Chernobyl? No. No, I've heard so many good things about it though. Yeah. It's, it's it's really good, but it's it's heavy. Um, it's pretty good on the. I mean, very good on the science side of it. Like they nail the physics of it. Like it's, I mean, it, it, you know, it's still dramatized, but it's it's pretty spot on. What's the show that um, you've seen that you thought, wow, that's like pretty accurate, or or movie? 
I mean, ch ch as I say, ch Chernobyl does a pretty good job. Um, uh, let me think. What shows do a really good job? You know, I, I will say this though: most of this, there are scientists, some of them particularly quite prominent ones, who like watch films and TV and like just love to pick apart the science. And that's not <laughs> me at all, really. <laughs> um, I like, you know, I'm able to kind of ignore ignore the kind of oddities and the strange mm. um strange things going you know n things that aren't quite right that, that they've done uh, yeah. for the most part unless you know unless it gets particularly silly um and you know i think they'd bother most people um but but generally i'm able to that's a happy way to live <laughs> yeah you deal with like real science enough in your your work life you know you don't yeah. want to have to deal with it too much when you're just enjoying entertainment yeah yeah although you know most most scientists i know like oh, not most but many uh the kind of science fiction and the the sort of the the films and tv and books they read and media it's pretty space-based stuff i mean often a lot of people get involved in you know space as a career because they're interested in space when they were kind of younger um and so those two things go hand in hand um i want to go to something this is a question i've been wondering now actually since the start of the call so um have you seen the clips uh of um the aliens, <laughs> supposedly aliens, UFOs. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I saw some of them. I, this is the one that um, uh, the guy from Blink-182 was really into a, like a year ago, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's his name? Oh, I, I, I think I sent that to Adam. He's the Blink-182 Blink yeah. singer, isn't he? Uh, Blink. Is it Tom DeLong? Is it him or is it a different one? I think it's Tom DeLong. That sounds familiar. Um, Tom DeLong, you're, I think it yeah. is Tom DeLong. Yeah, he's the singer. Yeah. So he, I mean, he got. It was kind of funny because he, I don't know, was super into aliens for a long time, and um, and then it, like a year ago or something, he's like, I found the videos, and then I mean, I don't know how involved he was, but then he put them out, and everyone's like, Holy, wow, he <laughs> he did find something. So it's kind of. It's kind of interesting. Um, I think the you know the videos they put out are kind of interesting. I'm not sure they in any way convince me that there's intelligent life kind of <laughs> buzzing the planet. Um, but I think I think kind of mysteries are mysteries are fun, and it's no doubt to me that these are mysterious. People have looked at these and aren't sure what's going on. Um, I I think. I think my first and certain, almost my last thing wouldn't be to jump to, you know, this is the, there for its aliens. There's all sorts of other weird things it could be. Um, but, you know, I like mysteries. I've heard theories that, oh, this only, this only really works for one of the videos, but due to how rotoscope cameras work, the light, um, the light reflecting off of, like, the jet's flames can make it look like a disc-like shape. So as the as the as the jet rides away from the camera, it could look like a UFO. Is a theory I've heard. Yeah, I mean, certainly, if I was looking for an answer, I would. I'd be going to um, people who are expert in in aircraft imagery, you know, and, and cameras and and things like that uh, uh, first, rather than anything extraterrestrial in origin. Um, <laughs> you know, that said. The search for intelligent, you know, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, I think, is really important. And I, um, I'm like involved in some some kind of loosely involved in some kind of SETI collaborations. I think, you know, the idea of SETI, um, it got, you know, it's kind of popularized um, in the in the eighties. Carl Sagan was a big proponent of it. Um, it was um, shown, you know, the movie one of my favorite movies contact did a great job of kind of demonstrating to some of the well, it wasn't it was certainly a dramatization it wasn't uh, based on real life events but there was 
influenced by some of the early kind of SETI um, researchers. Um, the, the main character from the movie Contact was famously um, based on a, loosely based on a real person called Jill Tata, who works at the SETI Institute in, in California. Um, and, and, and then I think SETI research kind of went out of favor for various reasons. Um, almost, you know, kind of getting sidelined a little bit. Um, but now I think SETI research or, or, or stuff like that is, is very much back in kind of favor. You know, people are, people are doing some kind of a lot of really, really nice research looking, looking for extraterrestrial intelligence out there. Um, there's been a whole bunch of new money put into the search for SETI um, a, by a certain private foundation um, which is, is, is funding a bunch of this work right now. Um, we still haven't found anything because it's a very large parameter space to search, but, um, I think, I think with, with this whole, you know, discovery of planets, knowing there are small planets out there, knowing there are small planets orbiting stars, not too far away, the, the kind of this idea that we should search for life beyond the solar system and search for intelligent life particularly has, has kind of picked up steam. I mean, it's it's so massive. That it's almost I've heard it explained like the chances of there not being life is almost smaller because it, it's such a large universe. It's 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 really hard to say. I mean, we have no clue. Um, mm. Yeah. So on one side, you know, if we found life in one place, then the kind of statistics tell us that it's 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 they should be everywhere, you know, because. Y- you do get one-off random events in, in, in nature that happens. Um, and you get things that are very common and you don't tend to get things that are in the middle um, because if you multiply, you know, two times or, or you know, it, it happens twice, but you multiply it by extremely large number, it becomes extremely large number. Um, but there's still the chance that, you know, what happened on earth was so exceptionally unlikely that it didn't happen anywhere else. Um, I kind of don't really buy that for simple life. I can't imagine that the, the circumstances that, that created, you know, the simple initial biological life on earth were unique in our galaxy. That just seems too unlikely for me. Um, intelligent life like us, or at least, you know, intelligent life that could communicate. Um, I hope we're not the only intelligent life that can communicate out there. Um, but it's certainly not impossible. What do you think, um, and I think this is an interesting one, if we do find intelligent life, what does that tell us about, well, I guess, life itself? What does it, what does it tell us that there are, you know, multiple, you know, that it seems to... I guess not not that it's necessarily part of a process, but I guess the well, I guess it could be that intelligent life is actually part of a natural process, I guess. Yeah, I, I think that that's exactly right. If we find life, it tells us it's 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 a natural you know, one of the outcomes of forming planets is to create intelligent life. That's that's what it tells us. Right now, we don't know. We don't know if we're just, you know, an exceptionally unlikely you know, random freak occurrence that just happened, or if it just, it's, it's one of the outcomes. Um, I, 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 I mean, I wouldn't do what I'm doing. And I know a lot, most people who work in the kind of topic I wouldn't work in, I work in, wouldn't do it if they thought that life was, if we were the only ones out there. We wouldn't be spending all this effort um, searching for life if we didn't think there was a good chance we'd find it. Um, but most of that is focused on simple life, um, right now, you know, simple biological life, just because, you know, it's, it's much, it's much more likely really, I mean, we don't know, but it's probably much more likely that that exists than complex intelligent life. Um, but then like, oh, sorry, yeah. oh, sorry, you, no, no, go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, and then, but then to then to just expand that, if we do find intelligent life, which, like you said, it's it's very unlikely compared to just finding other life. What do you what do you think? Will that will that change? I guess how science how 
scientists see things that if we find intelligent life it means that necessarily intelligent life forming is just part of a natural process if that makes sense i i, I mean finding intelligent life for me i think changes everything everything about our understanding of life on earth if we're you know if we're not alone um it would change society i think um you know it would change science you know we want to learn about how how to, you know how to efficiently use our planet how to efficiently you know feed our people make technological progress um if there are other places out there, other places we can learn from, um, I think it would rapidly increase kind of the efforts and technology to go and try and learn from what other places are doing, as well as learning from what, what you know, what we can do here on Earth. Um, I remember that a few a few years back when we we spoke, you uh, said you believe that we'd find life between ten and fifty years. Do you still think that's the case? Yeah, I think 10 to 50. Did I say 10 and 15? 50. Uh, yeah, 50. Yeah, I think 10 to 50 is 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 the right kind of time frame. Um, so I, I, I think, so, so, so NASA's launching James Webb Space Telescope. It's going to be able to probe the atmospheres of some planets. Um, it's probably not the right tool to be very good at searching for and finding life beyond our solar system. Mm. It, it might be able to do be sensitive a little bit but probably to not enough planets in order to give us like a good opportunity um but nasa is right now going through a process of of looking into what the um telescopes and space telescopes to be built in the 2030s will look like um and so, uh, two of the four concepts they're looking at um are going to be part of the primary science case is looking for planets uh, to study planets that might have life. So looking at planets around stars like the sun, orbits like Earth's kind of orbit, you know, a same kind of year, um, the size of Earth, and studying the atmospheres of, of these kind of planets. Um, and those kind of concepts, if we can build those, they'll be very sensitive and the best bet for finding, finding life. Um, so I, I think, you know, in the 2030s, I think there's a real good chance of finding life beyond the solar system if it's out there. Um, wow. Before that, I think we'd have to get extremely lucky. Mm. It's, 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 it's insane to think that we even have, like, telescope technology. We'll, we'll have it in that, that good in that short, that short amount of time. Yeah, you know, we, we kind of know how to do it or at least we know most of the things how to do it. There are still engineering challenges on how, how exactly to build it. Um, but, you know, we, we know what to build and we roughly know how to build it. Um, it's hard and it's expensive, um, but uh, that's what we kind of do at NASA is hard and difficult challenges. Um, the biggest problem, you know, the, a lot of the technology in order to like, what we really want to do is take a picture of a planet, essentially take a photograph of a planet around another star. Um, we call it direct imaging. Um, and then we can measure what we call the spectrum, looking what, what the light looks like and look for what the, that tells us about the chemistry of the, the planet's atmosphere. Um, but in order to do to see a planet, we need to block out the starlight. You know, if you look, if you stand up in your, you know, go in your garden and you can see a star, um, those stars are, are going to be you know, a, more than a billion times brighter than any planets around them. So effectively what we need to do is we need to be able to block out that starlight and then see the planets around them. Um, and that's a lot harder than just kind of sticking your thumb up and blocking the star. Um, but, you know, the, the basic idea of it is you need an extremely carefully designed thumb that you hold in exactly the right spot and it blocks out the starlight and then you can see the planets around it. Um, but we know how to do that. We just need to build it and test it um, now. And so that's, I think, a very exciting, you know, future direction that we're going to go in. Speaking of this, this may sound like a silly question, but I was just curious because you were talking about um, starlight. Do you ever come with problems that, because a lot of starlight can be coming from 
you know stars that are already dead you know there's a massive amount of time between the when the light reaches us do you ever have problems with that or is that not really a problem so so most of the stars in our galaxy are, are still alive you know are still exist it's the kind of issue that you're looking back in time only really becomes a big kind of thing you know concern like that when you're looking say at other galaxies you're looking really far away um right you know as i say the nearest star to us is like one light year or so away um so of course that star's still there but even as you go much further you know the center of the galaxy is 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 something like six thousand or several thousand light years away um, I mean, these stars don't change much on timescales of thousands of years, um, yeah. even really millions of years. You know, the sun looked very much like it did, does now, a billion years ago. It hasn't changed all that much. And so most of these stars haven't changed all that much on that timescale. Um, and so, and especially for the planet search that we do, we look, we're looking, we say in our kind of local backyard, solar backyard, or the Cosmic backyard, I guess. But um, as, as the closest stars to us are the ones we're most interested in. Mm. Oh, well, it's, yeah, it's um, it's an exciting topic. I don't know I can I can I can't understand half of what you guys do, even like a quarter, anything basically. I'm very happy being a journalist, but. <laughs> But it's 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 cool to talk about. It's um, you know, it stirs up the imagination in a way. Yeah, I think it's you know, it, it's a really fun topic. You know, NASA does a lot of, you know, a lot of different things. Um, I mean, most of what NASA does isn't isn't necessarily science. It's building it's building things. But even the areas of science, um, you know, a, a lot of it is 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 somewhat complex to explain. But but for me, the reason. The reason I love planet research so much is, is you know, the basics of we want to go and study a planet, we want to study its atmosphere, and we want to search for life. You know, people are like, oh yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that sounds interesting. And it's 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 the the basic concepts of it are, aren't particularly complicated, um, unlike a lot of other you mm. know other other physics out there. You know, the physics of black holes intrinsically is is complicated. The <laughs> physics of of planets, it's it's not you know. It's not all that bad. Well, um, I was, I feel I feel like the most interesting thing that I got out of this. I mean, obviously the science was amazing, but it's the it's almost the very the the very simple to understand concepts like is there alien life out there? You know, what would it be like in different planets? It's those very sort of well, I guess they're not basic, but those simple to understand concepts that are what, what apparently what draw in a lot of NASA scientists, what draw in a lot of people that want to explore space. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, for me, the most, you know, a topic, the topic that's known as astrobiology is, is incredibly exciting to me because it kind of, it, it bro broaches the kind of me, me who I, I study, I focus on studying the stars and kind of planets go around the stars. And so I study the planets, but other people come from a completely opposite. They like, I study micro, they study microbiology and then they're like, okay, so building up from microbiology, how do we then get life and how might that life form around stars that are different from from our sun so i think those two different directions that people are coming from is, is interesting and and really you know these kind of worlds collide as kind of interesting science comes out maybe one last thing that we should probably touch on because i don't think we did is um um what um movie have you seen during quarantine or like series that just hooked you like what what, what sorry, series I mean, I... oh sorry sorry uh, no, go ahead no no i was just gonna re-say what adam said so yeah i i mean i can talk about you know the movies i've been watching a lot of movies and tv i mentioned earlier the expanse has been mm. fantastic because i think you know that that takes a look at what what might life actually be like if we lived beyond earth and I think that that's exciting to me. Um, I've also been, you know, taking this opportunity to watch a bunch of old movies uh, that are completely different from space and space science. I watched a uh, Dial M for Murder the other day, which is a pretty great Hitchcock movie from uh, 50s or 60s. 
Um, I watched a German movie called Titanic that came out not too long after Titanic. And then after watching it, learned that there was some fairly heavy-handed uh, Nazi propaganda at the end. So oh. oh, no. Fairly, fairly, fairly unexpected. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't terrible. It was the... It ended with a... And, and, and England and America let this happen, and look how terrible England and America are. For, they think they can build ships, but they just sink. Oh. That's an interesting direction to take to, uh, Titanic propaganda. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was pretty, pretty amusing. Um, but yeah, generally, I've been watching plenty of TV and movies and, you know, keeping, keeping sane. Mm. Um, <laughs> if you had to, uh, just quickly, recommend a sci-fi series uh, for people in quarantine right now, what would that sci-fi series be? I mean, I think The Expanse is, is an incredible TV series. Um, I still love Battlestar Galactica. I think that's a fantastic... Oh, fantastic nice. show uh you know it's worth going back to watch um uh so that's those are my two two picks and completely off topic i'm sorry uh because i i'm always interested in what sci-fi uh fans opinion of this uh what did you think of firefly oh i love firefly firefly is fantastic yeah it's, it's, i mean space and westerns that's my that's a good takes two boxes i like <laughs> It's a shame it never got that like second season. Oh yeah, certainly is. Certainly is. You can see some resentment in your eyes. Yeah, certainly <laughs> is. Yeah. Fox yeah, does well. just tend to. Oh, sorry, Fox just does tend yeah. to kill off sci-fi series for some reason. So many. Yeah, I mean, the Expanse was was cancelled as well. You know, sci-fi gets cancelled, and but they Amazon brought back Expanse, which was nice. Mm. Orwell, Orwell was on Fox, wasn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, the Orville, the Orville. Orville I haven't seen sorry. that. I hear it's pretty good. I know. I'm surprised it lasted as long as it uh, as as it has. Yeah, I hear it's pretty good. So. <laughs> wow. Okay. So is oh, sorry. I'm just trying to. Think. Is there anything else, Adam? We've got on the agenda. Oh, I don't know. No, I, I, the agenda. I think we've covered everything. I'd say. <laughs> okay. Um, I have to drop off. Um, basically now. Um, mm, but if you think of more stuff and you want to tag up again, you know, I'm at home. Today's been relatively unusually busy, but most days aren't. So, um, oh, that sounds amazing. More stuff you want to, if you want to do some, pick up some more stuff, let me know. Oh, definitely. Thank you. Yeah, no, we'll take that opportunity. That sounds great. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Thank Cheers. you so much. Right. Have the rest no of your problem. day. No problem. Thanks a lot. Bye.